is up everybody it is alex from heavy new york calling from the altar again and this time we are here with tim of neo Bliviscaris. it is so great to be able to talk with you thanks for being here my pleasure thanks for having me anytime man anytime it's so amazing to have you here your last album earn is easily without a doubt my favorite record to go back to from 2017 and now we got Excel coming out uh, very very soon this March was this intended to just be kind of like the sequel or picking up where you left off after Earn or was this meant to signify a new beginning for Neil Bliviscaris? Uh I, I guess every album kind of feels more like the, the next chapter in like a ongoing book that you never know how many chapters there are in it um, you know, with, with each record, I think we always start afresh thinking about, you know, what can we, what can we do now? But at the same time, it's, it's never really too thought out. It's really just, Hey, let's start writing some stuff and, and see what comes out. And then, uh, it's maybe more halfway through that process that we work out what we've got. And so with this album, you know, halfway through the process, we actually had an enormous amount of stuff going in all sorts of different directions. So then the challenge within the band was working out, okay, well, how do we like choose which of the things that we're working on fit together to make a, a record? Because it was like, well, we could almost go in a few different directions. Um, and so in the end it was, you know, choosing this group of songs that we felt, you know, fit together uh, in a way that was an important musical statement for us. And, you know, that, that next level of, of what we were trying to do, which is, you know, to keep pushing ourselves to keep doing new things and, and keep expanding, you know, what it is um, for our music to, to be. Well, as a fan of Neo Bliviscaris, I could tell what would be off the portal of I, what would be off of Citadel, what would be off Urn, and now with this new album as well. So you mentioned that it's not too thought out, but is there at all any preconceived vision that you go into it? Because there's such an emotion that's channeled into that. I mean, does it come spontaneously or is it representative of a past element? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we learn a lot from from each album that we do. So, you know, the first two albums, uh, there's a couple elements of that. One is, of course, with the songwriting, every time we write a song in a particular way with a particular structure or a particular style, we, we work out, oh, hey, that's something that we can do pretty well. You know, uh, if it made it on the record, it at least means that we think that. Um, and so when we go to a, a new fresh round of songs, it's kind of thinking about, okay, well, what did we do on the last record and what's something we could do that, that builds on that that's a bit fresh. Um, and sometimes that comes into play where, you know, we might get halfway through writing a song and we're thinking about what to do to, to bring it to a climax and it might be going, ah, oh, you know what, this idea we've got, we, we did that type of ending three times on the last record, let's not do that, let's deliberately do something different and let's deliberately explore some different ideas. And so sometimes it is just from that going, well, this is what we've done, so we know this works, but hey, we've done that a bunch, let's deliberately just explore random different things and see what, what fits. Um, you know, with this record, you know, it's, it's a real um, mixture of, of different sounds and the songs are all quite different from each other whilst I think, you know, sending a listener on a, a particular journey from the start through to the end you know through a lot of different places and i think it fits together really well and the challenge with that is of course we have multiple songwriters in the band you know we have um different songs where there are different members that maybe were the impet impetus for the the main bulk of you know getting a particular song started and that and that varies from song to song it's always been like that on our records and that's one of the reasons why you know on misery chord one and two um, why they sound, you know, very different in different directions. Cause it's, you know, that element of, you know, um, certain members kind of kicking things off and then different members coming in and going, oh, hey, let's take it off in this direction. If, if people were to get to know all the members of Neo Bliviscaris really well, where they'd be able to like listen to a song and be like, oh, this was written by that guy. This was written by that guy. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, yes, but it's not as simple as that as far as, cause it's never this guy wrote the whole song um because the way we get our sound is by integrating all of the different elements that we have within the band and so it really needs a bit of a collaborative approach but i guess where the difference is is the the original um, inspiration and the starting point which is normally like the guitar riffs or the chords and things like that 
um, where that comes from. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not that hard to tell the difference because basically, you know, if you hear something that's like quick changes and technical, it's probably Benji that wrote it. Um, or on the new album, there's some of that stuff that was written by Martino as well. Um, this is uh, the first album writing with him, and he really had a big impact. Like uh, the song that's the second single, Growl, that's going to be out um, pretty soon. Um, uh, he actually wrote a lot of the guitarists in that song, um, and he, his style kind of meshed really well with Benji's. Um, so it's a bit maybe hard to tell the difference between the stuff that they contributed on this record, which was really cool how seamlessly he fit in. Whereas, yeah, for the stuff that uh, I wrote, because I'm not a guitarist, but I write um, a lot of the music. So like Misery Called One and Two, you know, one, part one is like Benji and Tino were the, the primary writers, all the riffs and stuff like that. And Misery Called Two, most of that was written by me and the chord progressions and the way that develops. And you can hear that there's a lot more repetition and development. There's a lot more strings. There's, um, it's a lot less technical. It's a lot more um, influenced by different types of songwriting structures. But when you put those two together, you get this big 17 minute epic um, in a way that no one could do by themselves, you know, um, because we have these different approaches. And uh, we kind of build on each other through there, you know. Um, so Benji will send something through and be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. What if we did this next? And then that might lead to a section that then goes off in a different direction. Um, and, and likewise, you know, the same with some of the stuff that, you know, Matt contributes, you know. Um, like Equas, a lot of that was um, written him and I just like, you know, um, in his his studio working through some ideas for that. Um, and, you know, it just really varies song to song, which I think is one of the, the interesting things. It's it's challenging sometimes because there are a lot of different ideas. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what well, it is how we get the sound. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because like there are so many different sounds and so many different styles of Neil Blibiscaris. Like I remember first listening to Libera Part 1 off of Urn and to have something as melodic but also as heavy to have a guitar solo that rips and a violin solo that it's just a uh, goosebump inducing it has to be sort of like e a, maybe a little bit easier to sort of go outside the box and experiment a little bit with your sound since you already have so many styles, right? Yeah, I think like we just add to what what we know we uh, can work. And I think from the very, very beginning in the band, um, you know, I always had this attitude of let's just write something we like. And if we like it, you know, forget about like what genre it is or forget about if it's supposed to work. And that was like in the early days, you know, we started adding in even just really simple things like some of my clean vocals on Portal of Eye, I, you know, had some uh, like a, some like high falsetto clean vocal parts that were just kind of over the top. And that's like really considered quite like unmetal, you know. Um, you're referring to as Icicles just, Fall? Yeah, you know, that's one example for sure. And, you know, especially as like a younger guy, sometimes you'd be a bit self-conscious about like being like metal, like especially in like a local metal <laughs> scene. Yeah. Um, and so you do stuff it's like, this is good, right? Like, and cause you know, you just try to be yourself. And over time, you know, when you do something and you release it and people like it and you were just being yourself, it's like, oh, hey, if I just am myself and then put that out musically and we combine that with our, our unique people that we are, because everyone's, you know, different creatively. Um, and with Portal of I, people liked it, you know, it wasn't a super big album, but in an underground way, the album was very popular. And that gave us that confidence on Citadel to go, oh, well, let's just be ourselves again. And then that was a little bit different, but we would just be ourselves. And that's really, I think, the main approach is like, let's just do what we really like. And um, if we love it, hopefully people will like it. And But even if they don't, if we really love it and we're really proud of it, then you can never have any regrets, you know? Um, and that's the most important thing to just make sure that what we're doing artistically is genuine, reflection of what we love and really just not give a shit about what people think um, while we're writing. And then once it's done, you go, okay, well, how do we mark this to try to get as many people listen to as possible? But that's a s totally separate thing. And we try to really make sure we just forget about the fact there is an outside world while we're writing and just kind of explore what, what we want to do 
when we're in that creative process. Before we get into the lyrical aspect of it and concepts, I wanted to ask this about the music too, because I feel like if, if Neo Bliviscaris was an instrumental band, I feel like the music would do just as good of a job at conveying meaning and storytelling and really all conveys the emotions in a way. Would you say that every instrumentation, whether it will be the rhythm or the guitar work or the, or the or orchestral parts, do you feel that they express different sides of Neo Bliviscaris in a way? Do they have their own individual elements that express a certain style? Or when they're all together on the same song, they're all expressing the same thing? I mean, I guess it can work both ways, you know, where like the role of, for example, the violin can vary so enormously where we have these like layered um, string parts and violin sections. Um, we have like kind of pretty, you know, violin uh, melodies. We have kind of screaming distorted, you know, violin, um, you know, weird screeching noises uh, and everything in between where the, the role of the violin can be supporting a heavy guitar riff. It can be to create some beauty it can be um, as an intense like lead solo, like mimicking the role of what a guitar solo would be like in a metal band. I think that a lot of the different um, elements can combine in different ways. So obviously like the rhythm guitars, you know, certain elements have particular sounds that are fairly consistent, but the other elements can really move around. And I guess that's a lot of what, what I do in the band is kind of working out what we can do to to really mix up and push things in different directions but even with you know deciding you know when to have a guitar solo violin solo bass solo clean vocals heavy vocals strings choir like there's a lot of things that flow in and out of our songs and um a lot of that is just determined by what feels right when we're writing without any kind of preconceived ideas it is just going hey what what feels like it could be good and then also especially when we're a bit further into the writing process it's going you know what what will create balance on the record um so that you know if we just had um you know two or three violin solos in a row it's like oh hey this sounds great and we could do another violin solo here but hey we haven't had a big epic guitar solo for for a little while um and so let's let's shift the focus over there and then that can really make a big difference because then the listener is not just hearing maybe a, a well-written solo but their focus is moving throughout the band through an individual song and also throughout the record as well. When it comes to the lyrical aspects of it as well, have you always preferred to have music present before you could think of a lyrical meaning or an idea in a way? Or has a lyrical meaning that you or your other vocalists have come up with maybe actually helped dictate the sound of the song? Yeah, so we're pretty consistent with this, which is that basically the music always comes first and then Zen does all of the lyrics. Um, his, 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 uh, his and my lyrical writing style were quite different. And I, you know, when the first band first started, I didn't really sing. Um, and so he would kind of write the lyrics and just do an, a line or two for me. And we kind of kept in that because obviously there's a bit of a, a rhythm and a style in the way that our lyrics fit now. But basically, like, for example, with a, with a song like uh, the first single, Equas, it's really interesting because I, I see comments online about like oh you know is uh you know this this violin part's meant to be like the neighing of the horses and the guitar riff you know of the the galloping of the horses through the thing and stuff like that but it's actually the other way around where the song is completely done um like at least 80 90 percent finish and there's no lyrics and the the vocals even my vocals i mostly write the melodies before i have any lyrics and i will send a recording of a melody with me singing with no lyrics just with random syllables stuff like that to zen and he will write lyrics that then match somewhat the melody and then we kind of come together and we adjust my melody to fit with his lyrical ideas so he will listen to the demo of the song and then feel what that demo inspires in him lyrically and then that'll start to get brought together with the music so it is basically always the music first and then coming together from there and for this it's also, we had a bunch of demos and him listening to the entire direction of the record and going, okay, what's this combination of songs feel like? Um, how does, how can I create a theme through the record and things like that, which was how the, uh, the kind of um, exile, you know, the, the exiled um, theme kind of came into this album, basically from Zen, like reflecting on 
what it was inspiring in him with the music and also I guess with where the world was at with you know so many people being like exiled from their normal daily lives with all the lockdowns and stuff like that which were happening while he was writing the lyrics it's it definitely is going to influence you one way or another and isolation is without a doubt one of the greatest sources of creativity and being that you and zen though like to me the sound of neo Bliviscaris, one of the many sounds that define neo Bliviscaris, is the combination of both your vocal efforts because i think that the aggressive vocals express something that the clean vocals can't and vice versa i think that they really convey their own emotions so would it help if you guys have a mutual emotion when going into the song together or could both of you being in your own different worlds or being in your own elements actually help enhance the differences of your vocal styles? Yeah, great question. So I think that when, uh, when Zen and I are writing our vocal parts, we, we are in constant communication. Um, and it's very much a, something that we work out together. So the individual lines, of who sings where or when we're singing both together that's always something that we work out as a team essentially um and sometimes we'll even work on each other's parts you know, together to make sure that they're they're fitting together because they do play off each other a lot and so if we were completely off in our separate worlds it may or may not fit together um, and then combined in with that is the role of the violin because sometimes you you could do clean vocals or for the melody, you might use violin. And so it might be, oh, we want the violin and the heavy vocals maybe at the same time. Um, and that might be a good combination that we want. Whereas other times it might be, we want the, the two different vocals or you know the interplay being different. But um, it's definitely something that's highly coordinated and that we work together closely on that to make sure everything it matches. Because you know we kind of come up with those initial ideas separately, but even from the very beginning, you know, we have a demo sent through and often within, you know, hours or even days, it's, um, it's like, Hey, I've got ideas for 227 and 350 and blah, 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 you know, where are your ideas? Um, and we, and we go back and forth and if there's a section where we both have ideas, it might be going, okay, well, we want the, the balance of the different vocal parts and, and we kind of discuss them and work on it from there. Being that both your vocals and the violin are both very, very melodic, do they express convey or express a similar emotion or do you almost look at those two forms of instrumentation to maybe be different forms of self-expression you could express one side of yourself with one element as opposed to another yeah so i guess um the the roles can be similar as far as that a section might be able to um it might work well with a melody and then obviously there's choices with what instrument to to use to bring that melody forth whether it's singing or violin stuff like that um and there's even uh there's even a couple of viola parts i threw on this record as well um but i guess a lot of it comes down to simply what is inspired within me so when i'm listening to something the types of melodies that suit a vocal part or a violin part for me are not necessarily the same and so often it's just listening to the demo that we've got. And if I hear a great vocal part in mind, then that's what I do. Whereas some other parts may be a bit too busy and the sort of melody that I like to sing that might suit my voice might not really suit, but the way I play on the violin might suit. So often um, I would say there's not too many times where uh, it's not clear which one or the other, but having said that, when it came to, I think it was Growl, um, some of the parts where I'm singing originally in the original demos, I was gonna play violin in all the spots where I sing. And I'm like, ah, and it just wasn't quite right. And I wasn't quite happy with it. And then I ended up flipping the whole thing around and, 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 and singing in some of those spots instead. And, and that's something that every now and then happens where it's just, you know, keep searching and searching until something kind of locks into place that it is exciting because that's the thing when we're writing like i i love our music um and if i'm not loving the song that we're writing i'm always concerned because i know that every song of ours if it's if we finish it i love it and if if we if we don't finish it it's because it it lost inspiration somewhere along the way um so if i'm not really excited by the parts i'm writing and what's coming in the song then I'm always like just searching, searching, searching to see how to how to get that because I know that 
if I'm not feeling it, then then you're probably not going to feel it either. <laughs> you led me perfectly into the next question, actually, like perfectly, because in order to get that inspiration, in order to get that creative energy to make you want to pick up your instrument and write, do you need to kind of put yourself in a specific place? You need to be in a specific element in order to uh, cultivate ideas or does inspiration just strike out of the blue for you? Uh, uh, yeah, great question. I would say mostly um, I have to put myself in that situation, but it's not, um, it, it can strike out of the blue, but if I create the circumstances for it to arise. So what I mean by that is well, I, I, don't, I don't come up with a lot of musical ideas if I'm listening to music all the time. So for example, if I'm just, you know, going for a walk and I'm listening to stuff on my headphones, I'm just obviously enjoying the music that I'm listening to. But when I'm in a writing mode or when I'm looking to be in a writing mode, I will spend a lot of time not listening to music a lot of time just like walking around doing mundane things kind of leaving i guess space empty space in my mind to put those different things and explore different ideas um, and what i find is that you know i might just be out like at, literally out for a walk and then have a melody kind of start floating through my head and that's the sort of stuff so i know that if i create that circumstances of like um create some space to not do too much and then see what comes up um, it can be one way that I am creative. Another way though is literally getting a demo and just improvising over and over and over on a particular pipe. And so there's uh, quite two different approaches. So especially with um, the violin, the violin stuff, it will be a lot like me bringing out my Pro Tools on my computer, um, bring stuff up, put it on repeat, and I'll just record like 20 different solos. And, um, and then one of them might be like, oh, that, that one felt amazing. And then I go back and I study and I, and I kind of cut it up and then I try to work out what I want to adjust and, and go from there. But it is very much like a, a frame of mind where I can go several months without writing anything if I'm not creating those um, conditions for, for what works for me and my creativity. But on the other hand, if I'm deliberately in that creative space, I can be going, okay, this is what I know I need to be creative. And so I can um, construct my life and my day to day life in a way to make space for that. The difficult thing, of course, is that balance between stuff that's going on in your life. And so the thing I found difficult was finishing the record. I found finishing this record really hard because we had all this initial inspiration where most of the record was done, the pandemic hit, a lot of things fell apart in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I was having a lot of things, uh, big personal things happen in my life that I was struggling with. And, um, you know, I, I would go back to the record and I'm trying to finish off my parts. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> this part's no good. And it took me a while. Like it took me months um, to be able to get back to the stage where um, I could really get back in that headspace. And, and that's because it is a really active engaged um creative mind space and i feel like um the ability to to tap into that it, it's not always it, it's not always that straightforward you know if you've got things going on like um, people talk about you know hardship being a great thing for creativity but sometimes it's after the hardship's done yeah That's, absolutely you know as opposed to in the middle of it because it can sometimes be too much to be able to kind of tap into that. And that was, I think, the challenge through the pandemic. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, man, like, it's still going. Like, how, how do we finish this? And recording studios kept getting cancelled and, you know, the stuff was pushed back and this was pushed back and this was cancelled and it kept happening. And there was other stuff going on in our lives as well. And, um, and that created a lot of challenges as well. So it's a real, a real mixture. But I think for me, I'm pretty aware of what works for me and and what doesn't at least and so at least that enables me to um know what i'm aiming for when i'm trying to tap into that space well it, it, it's it's uh, really uh, gr good that you mentioned that because neil bliviscara songs are fairly fairly long and you know they definitely uh even though they're very long they do capture a moment i consider liberia to be your bohemian rhapsody that's what i call it and the way that everybody sings along at that final chorus is uh truly a 
truly breathtaking. But then uh, as Icicles Falls, which, uh, which is one of the greatest winter anthems, they really do capture imagery and emotion. But the longer you're working on something, because sometimes you do work on a song for days or weeks or months, maybe even years, do you find that the longer you work on something, the harder it is to sort of maintain that emotion or the initial inspiration that started that idea? Yeah, absolutely. And that was actually the big challenge with finishing my vocal parts because with a lot of my vocal parts, like for Equus, for example, you know, I, 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 I wrote most of that song and the, and the string parts and the vocal parts all in one go, like in this fit of inspiration in the one few, few day period in like late 2019. And the original demo recordings were poor quality recordings as far as the recording but the performances were really inspired because I, it was the initial inspiration of that song. Um, and I was so excited about it. I'm like, yes, this is gonna be amazing and blah, blah, blah. But the thing I found difficult was that my recording was supposed to be in April, 2020, a few months later that got canceled. You know, I started recording in June, 2021 final after multiple cancellations. Um, uh, but we kind of had run into more issues and more lockdowns, more cancellations. And it got to 2022 early 2022 and I'm trying to finish the vocals including for that song and I'm listening to the recordings and technically they were fine but it wasn't as inspired as the original demos and I'm like there's magic in this demo but it's just not a good quality recording but these good quality recordings didn't have that same emotion and it was because I was struggling to get back that original inspiration from like two and a half years earlier so that really took a bit of time and exploration to like delve back into that. Cause what I needed to do was really disappear back into that song and get super excited about it and not be thinking too much, just like disappear emotionally into the original impetus for when I was first writing those parts. And then in that process, the performances I actually think that came out on the record, I think are for me, I'm like most proud of, um, you know the clean vocals on this album like far more than um, any of the albums we've done in the past and part of it is because I was so determined to make sure that what you're uh, alluding to didn't happen because I was really aware of it like I was like oh man I'm not feeling this but I was really aware of it and so I was like pushing and pushing and pushing until eventually it was like ah there it is yeah and by that time man I'd recorded the song so many times <laughs> And so I got really good at seeing it technically. It was just finding that like raw emotion in the parts and in that perfect take. And, um, you know, I recorded the, those final parts, you know, some of them in this room at yeah, my home studio, which gave me that opportunity to, to do a, a lot of time on it, which was um, a challenge, but, you know, a good thing at the same time as well. Perfect. Uh, that was a really uh, great way of putting it as well. And I think you couldn't have answered it better. And again, led me perfectly into the next question because, you know, every record, you know, to quote Henry Matisse, the painter, every painting is a self portrait. The same thing could be every song that you create as well. Do you, and when you play these songs live, because do you want every album, do you want Portal of Eye to just be a representation of who you were in 2012, uh, Citadel to be a representation of who you are in 2014, and this a representation of who you are in 2017, and the same with Excel? Or do you think that maybe the songs can develop new meaning over time as you know listeners interpret it and as you experience more as well? Yeah, I think that the album itself is always a representation of that particular moment in time, like the recording on the album. The live show creates a great opportunity to bring who you are in this moment and join that with the audience and where they are in this moment. And, you know, as a singer, like as a singer, I'm so different to Portal of Eye. So if you hear me sing one of the songs of Portal of Eye live, it doesn't sound exactly the same. I'm like quite a different singer um, than I was a decade ago. Um, uh, and so that means that the experience for the listener is different. You know, all of us are different. There's, you know, some even people in the band, the lineup is different. And so the version that you're hearing live is something that exists just in that moment. I think that's what's spe special about concerts. That's what's special about live shows. So the album is the album, that's that moment in time, but the concerts are an opportunity to bring right now and for me to connect with you and just come together and just everybody in that room just be focused on the energy of that song and we can create new meaning to whatever we're experiencing right now in that moment 
then nothing else matters except for that. And then every concert, then you can redo that and try to recreate that in its own special way. And as somebody who has seen New Bolivascaris numerous times, I could I totally agree because every experience, even if you were to play the same set list every show, it would be a completely yeah. different experience. I haven't forgotten that amazing prank that happened during the Winter Sun tour, and that uh, I'll never forget that one. <laughs> uh, what a guy attacked you in a gorilla suit, which was definitely. Uh, <laughs> A good one. And then, you know, the Cradle of Filth tour was very different from the headliner tours that I've seen you on. But when you're playing live, is there at all maybe a similar energy or a similar um, emotion that's channeled into your live show as you are when you're songwriting? Or are they two completely separate mind frames altogether? I mean, they're quite separate, but at the same time, when I'm writing, I am visualizing how the song will sound live. Because for me, the concerts are kind of the payoff like the most fun element about being in the band is the shows so writing is great um recording is great but they're kind of a, a labor of love that's kind of torturous and difficult um and that you only really get to enjoy it like sporadically in fits and starts whereas the show is this, this moment of kind of elation for me that i just really adore that experience of and so um i think that you know, just that, that difference in, in those means that um, when I'm writing, I'm imagining, like you talked about that bit in, in uh, you know, Libera Part 1 with the, the whole, um, you know, choir of voices that come in in that second half of the song. You know, that was something where when I was writing that part, I'm imagining the live show and I'm hearing the voices in my head and I'm imagining what the energy and the emotion will be like. And then when we're recording, we're trying to match that imagination that I have to bring that to life. And that's really the process of going, okay, I have these ideas in my head and we're trying to make them come to life on the record. And then we're trying to replicate that on the live show um, as well. And then really just kind of bringing that all to, um, to fruition. So it's definitely, it's separate, but at the same time, I'm always imagining uh, both of them at the same time imagining this song and how can we create this on the album and but how will this sound live and will it have the energy can i imagine the crowd um feeling this the intensity of this part and how will that move them up and down throughout that um you know even more so than imagining someone listening at home in their room, you know? Um, it's kind of that, that, that thing I'm keeping in mind for sure. Well, but when you're recording in the studio, you know, the studio is a very static sort of controlled environment. And I see so much freedom on stage when you guys play. I could tell that you go away when you're singing or when you're uh, playing the violin. And same goes for all of your members. So do you find that to be almost like an extra hurdle to sort of bring that live energy into a studio where it seems like that there's anything but live energy? Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think the main thing with that is just, of course, um, understanding the emotion, the energy of the part as it was originally written, um, and then making sure that the performances in the album match that. So that's what I talked about with the vocals of like feeling like that wasn't there and then having to look for it and find it and then being really excited when it was like, um, this is now here. Whereas then I guess uh, the, the tricky thing though is, is the mix. The mix is the thing where everything has to fit together in a certain way to have that energy be present and the roles have to be so fluid and change. And that's where, you know, on this record, it was the first album where we worked with Mark Lewis, not just mixing and mastering like we did with Earn, but also producing the album. And that, for me, is why this album sounds a lot more cohesive than anything that we've done before. And I, I personally really love this production. Um, and I think that it's a, uh, a better representation of our music because we um, were able to kind of bring that to life and have that energy. Because it's so easy in a studio to kind of make everything clear but boring. Um, and there's no energy in life and there's and life in the sounds and that's um, a big challenge not just in the performances but also in the way that it's mixed and that's definitely been a learning process with every album of like okay, how do we make the album have the energy that we normally have from the live show and how we get as much of that into the album recording as well and finally the question I wanted the final question I wanted to ask you is, is when you are bringing it live we talked about the meaning and like the lyrics and all that but you know when the listener interprets it you know I've played your music for a lot of people some people who 
know about you guys and have every album. Some people who may not be into this music but are interested in the technical elements and all that. People have felt many different emotions ranging from mesmerized to scared to very melancholy. And with one song, it could convey so much emotion. So when a listener is interpreting it and feeling your music and interacting with you, do you think that brings a new layer of meaning and a new layer of context behind your material? Yeah, I think that's one of the the beautiful things about music. You know, um, like oftentimes you talked about those list of different emotions. I think that often we create music that's very intense um, and it can be intense even when it's uh, not heavy. Um, it can just be intensely emotional and then people interpret that intensity in different ways. So some people will find something very sad. Like for me, it's funny because, you know, I hear sometimes incredibly intense music and people will be like, wow, that's so depressing. And I'm like, I listen to this and this makes me happy. This makes me like joyous, but it's because I'm connecting so deeply with the, with the music and that connection is filling me up with, uh, with happiness and joy, regardless of the, how the music might sound like from, from uh, like a, a more uh, objective position. And so I think that just the ability to share, you know, deep emotions and experiences and put them into your performances, into your songwriting, then people kind of internalize that and they create their own interpretation of that musical intensity. Um, which is just a beautiful thing to be able to do that and, and to be able to have people appreciate that. Cause when you first start writing and playing, you know, I mean, you hope maybe that people like what you do and connect, but you know, for a lot of people, they don't, um, uh, don't get that experience to the degree of what we're, uh, we're doing right now. And so just so grateful for the people who take the time to listen to us and give us a chance in, uh, sending them on that ride, you know, of sending them somewhere um, musically and emotionally, um, whether it's listening to the record or at the shows, because it's definitely you know a really great privilege to to be able to take up people's time and energy and, and space in, in that way. And so it's um, we're very fortunate to have so many people supporting us in the way they do here in what twenty twenty three. Now yeah, we are <laughs> absolutely. I can I was still in college when I first saw you on the Cradle tour. I believe that was your first North American tour, and. Yeah. I have not missed the New York City Neil Blitzkara show since, and I don't know many people who were at that show. It's a very similar case. We try to make it out because it's definitely event an event, and uh, I'm looking forward to the Beyond Creation tour that you're going to be doing. Is there just anything else that you would like to promote for Neil Blitzkara before we go? No, just uh, new album, March 24. Um, we are doing a big world tour. We've already announced Europe, UK, which is in May, June. USA, Canada, October, November. We're booking an Australian tour at the moment, which we'll announce hopefully not too long. Um, Latin America, Asia are in the works. Um, just trying to headline everywhere around the world, give lots of people the chance to see play. So wherever you are, hopefully we'll see you soon. And thanks for supporting us. Awesome. Thank you so much for an amazing conversation. Everybody, we are here with Tim of Neo Bliviscaris. Exile coming out March 24th via Season of Mist. Be sure to check it out. If you're just discovering this band, pick up their other three albums as well. They are an absolute amazing musical journey. This is Alex from Heavy New York. We will see you next time.